Um, so today we have Carla Stein uh, with her presentation, Dream Delving, Prospecting in Your Sleep for New Writing Ideas. Carla's poetry and illustrations have appeared in a wide variety of publications, and she has released two poetry pamphlets called Sideways Glances of an Everyday Sailor and Shrieking from the Shore. Carla is an associate member of the League of Canadian Poets and the current artistic director of Ward Storm Society of the Arts. So we're very excited to have her here to talk to us today. Welcome, Carla. Welcome, everyone. It's it's great to see you all here today. Um, and um, I hope the sun is shining wherever you're um, zooming in from. Um, it definitely is here. Um, and uh, I'm so happy that you're taking some time away from what might be one of the uh, a few sunny days that we have for the next few months um, to be here with with all of us and talk about what happens uh, when we're not awake and watching the sun and all of those hours that we spend um, doing things that uh, sometimes we don't talk about and that we would uh, really benefit from using in our writing and so um, I've just got a question a few questions for all of you to, to get things started off today um, I'm wondering how many of you remember your dreams and feel free to just pop that into the chat if you like. Um, if you don't want to answer that, you don't have to answer that. But just curiosity, I think everybody would like to know and April will sort of let us know what all of those comments might be like. So how many of you um, remember your dreams? Does that happen often? Does that happen just sometimes? Um, is it comfortable for you when you remember your dreams? Um, let us know what happens for you when all of that goes on. Also, um, wondering, have any of you ever uh, recorded impressions of your dreams? Because obviously, you're going to record if you are recording your dreams, and we'll talk about that more in the presentation, what you remember from the dream, because you're obviously not going to be recording while you're asleep. Although, I have to say, I, in doing some research for this presentation, apparently folks are now working on ways that we can directly record our dreams. Um, and I'm gonna be keeping tabs on that because that just sounds amazing. And I can't, for the life of me, figure out how that might work without us having a bunch of wires connected to our heads, et cetera, et cetera, which doesn't sound like it would be too helpful to sleep with, but <laughs> who knows, technology is an amazing thing and who knows what that might um, turn out to be. Um, futuristic writing um, has often come to pass. So, and have you, third question here, have you ever used um, your dreams, the content of your dreams or the feelings of your dreams, emotions of your dreams, um, the sensory kind of input from your dreams? Have you ever used any of that in your own writing? So if, feel free to put any of those comments in the chat. Um, April, if you want to move to um, the first slide. Sure. Yeah, so we've got lots of people saying they definitely remember their dreams or sometimes do. A um, couple people who record them as soon as they wake up. Um, yeah, a lot of people definitely remembering their dreams. Um, we've got someone here who says that he has used a tape recorder um, and would keep an oral record of them. Um, so it's not have to turn on the lights. That's a good idea. And any other comments that are coming in? I see a whole bunch of things in the chat there that. Yeah, we've got, it's hard to keep up here. Um, yeah, so we've got um, someone who says that um, they have had prophetic dreams um, where someone dies and then it has actually happened. Um, some people saying no, they have not so far used it in their writing, um, and others saying yes, um, many dreams have led to story ideas. Um, have Marianne says yes, have used dreams and poems. Um, Neil here, um, longtime student of dreams and dream interpretation and incorporating their wisdom into my life and writing. Um, I've written two poems about dreams I've had. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so lots of people remembering their dreams and kind of a mixture of some people have, looks like have used it in their writing and some people have never done so. So, to start out with here, <laughs> That, that's quite a lot of information for everybody to take in. And some of you are going to be more familiar with the topics that we discuss 
Um, other people are, are obviously new coming to, to thinking about this and ways to use it. And it's all perfectly okay. Wherever you're stepping into um, this kind of examination of dreams and dream writing and dream work, um, that's perfectly okay. Wherever you're stepping into that is just where you need to be at this time. So don't stress and don't worry um, if some of this information is new to you. Um, and for those of you um, who have uh, more uh, experience in dealing with, um, hopefully um, we'll be able to um, move you along even further in that experience today um, and enrich some of the ways that you can think about using your dreams in your writing today as well. Um, I also wanna say that um, you may notice that there's some um, images on some of the slides that you're seeing. I'm a visual artist as well as being a writer and a poet. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the images that you're seeing today often come to me in what is um, more of a liminal state, um, often between waking and sleeping. And we'll talk more about um, what liminal states are in our presentation as well today. So oftentimes people want to know um, what causes us to dream. Well, there's a whole bunch of theories out there. Um, and the reality at this point anyway, um, as far as science is concerned, is that nobody really knows. There's no definitive theory as to why we dream. Um, there is no kind of, of evidence as to how dreaming even works. Um, we have pleasant dreams, we have nightmares. Um, there's also no explanation as to why some of the dreams that we have, um, we just sort of wanna stay there and keep dreaming. And other ones, you know, I mean, really, when it gets really bad, I'm sure everyone's had that experience, we can wake up screaming or worse, um, and sometimes carry that, those awful feelings with us um, even throughout the day. No one knows why that happens either. Um, and there are, you know, people that, that, you know, consider that dreams can be prophetic. Um, there's lots of, of certain literature um, that has written about um, prophecies that have been made via dreams. Again, if, you know, that is something that fits for you and that fits with your belief system, that's perfectly okay. But scientifically, again, there's no explanation for why any of that happens. What we do know though, is that sleep is very important. Um, it affects almost all of our body systems. And if we not, aren't getting enough sleep and the recommended um, dose of sleep at this point is between seven and eight hours. Um, and if we're you know, experiencing insomnia, those kinds of things, um, chronic poor sleep, um, waking up and not having um, a good solid sleep, um, we know that that can increase uh, our health risks. Um, sleep apnea is something that you might be um, familiar with since we're all inundated with commercials about how to deal with it over time. Um, and that um, sleep apnea is actually when people are waking up because um, for one reason or another, um, they're uh, experiencing less oxygen in their systems um, and uh, are literally suffocating. Um, in their sleep. And so those kinds of conditions are really something that it's important not to ignore um, and make sure that we are for our overall health, um, let alone our overall writing health, um, make sure that, that uh, if we're experiencing difficulties with our sleep, we, we need to get help for that uh, and, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, we're staying healthy and well because we can't write if we're not doing well otherwise. Um, can we Go to the next slide, April. Is that the right one there? Yeah. So the jury's also out about um, what um, physiological aspects influence dreams. Um, there's a lot of information out there um, and people testing around around that. Um, but nobody really has any idea about um, what that happens as far as um, being right or wrong as well. Um, and so you might ask yourself like, you know, okay, well, if we don't really know what dreams are all about and we don't know why we dream and we don't know whether or not they're important, um, why do we care? I mean, they're not real. At least we don't assume that they're real. 
I mean, some people may believe that there are alternate realities that, that we contact um, when we're dreaming. But again, there's, there's no evidence of that one way or the other. And so what's, what's the benefit then of paying attention to our dreams? Do we not, you know, wouldn't it be better if we just sort of went to sleep and went like, oh yeah, we had a dream, who cares, so what? Well, as writers, um, we're often advised to write from our own experience. Uh, and yet, even though we spend approximately one third of our average human lifespan asleep, we rarely think of dreams as legitimately part of our experience. Joseph Campbell, um, who is a writer who, uh, and researcher who spent years and years um, looking at the mythology of uh, people all over the world, um, different social societies and cultures, um, came to believe that um, imagination is moved by your own inward experience as the aspects of your psyche are asking for fulfillment um, in your life. And that also has a lot of connections um, to what uh, um, a, a psychologist, or I should say psychoanalyst, um, Jung, um, referred to as well. So mythology um, and Jungian psychology um, also have a lot in common, and also looked at dreams as being important in our overall um, conceptualization of the world. So dreams can help you see the world in a new way. Um, you may never have actually seen a purple cow, but if you're dreaming about a purple cow, you could have a conversation with one. And if you record that when you're waking up, you can use that in your writing about what's it like to talk to a purple cow. Um, Dreams can assist you with getting past your personal sensors, that annoying little voice that, that often says, you can't write about that. Oh, that's too touchy. We, we don't want to go there, right? But if you're dreaming about that, something is telling you that it's okay to be looking at that and that it's part of your experience. And so that's a validating component then of our experience that, yeah, in fact, you know what? If I dream about that, I can write about that. Your imagination tends to run free in dreams. There's no judgment about the content. It allows you to write about possibilities rather than focus on only what you know factually. It's in the realm of what ifs. So what if there was a purple cow that visited in your dreams? What would happen? What would that cow do? What might it say to you? You might find out if you think about that while you're dreaming. Dreams also allow you to approach the shadow side of your mind. And that's a Jungian concept. Um, it's a, considered to be the part of us that we often turn off, that we don't want to look at, the dark thoughts, the negative or frightening perceptions um, that we often block when we're awake. But from a Jungian perspective, it was important to come to terms with the shadow side of ourselves and to acknowledge it um, and embrace it because it's trying to also tell us something that could be valuable to us. Dreams can also help you problem solve, especially when lucid dreaming is employed. And we'll talk more in a few minutes about what lucid dreaming is. And really important, dreams can help you get past a block in your writing project. Um, I've personally experienced that, um, particularly in my poetry, um, if I go to bed and try to um, direct a problem that I'm having with a particular piece of writing, oftentimes, and I don't know how it works, I can't tell you a formula for doing it, but I can tell you that giving myself that intention, oftentimes in the morning, I will wake up and go, ha, try this. It doesn't always work, but at least now I've got a way to get past that block. Um, can we move on to slide four? So do you need to interpret your dreams in order for them to be useful? Well, there are no absolute meanings for the contents of dreams. If you go to your friendly neighborhood bookstore or Indigo or Amazon or whatever, um, you will definitely see tons and tons of books about dream interpretation. Um, and if you look at all of those books about dream interpretation, you find that they don't always agree with each other. 
Um, and the reason for that is because there really isn't any kind of definitive, definitive way um, or definite way to say, you know, if you dream about an apple in your, in your dreams, um, this is what it means. If you dream about a key, this is what it means. And you'll find that a lot of, of dream interpretations will tell you that dream about a house, oh, you're dreaming about, you know, a relationship that you had with your mother or your father or your grandmother because you dreamed about a house. Um, dream about a car means uh, that you're thinking about changing direction in your life or some, some stuff like that. Um, that that's all, you know, if, again, if that works for you, if it feels good to be doing stuff like that, certainly go for it. Um, but um, do you need to know that in order to use that dream about a house in your writing? Absolutely not, because you can make that house be about anything that you want it to be about. It doesn't mean that you have to look in a book um, and find out, you know, what does it mean if I dream about a house? Um, there have been theorists um, like Sigmund Freud um, who attributed meanings to certain common motifs in dreams. Um, and you can look in psychoanalytic literature. Um, Sigmund Freud is very much the, uh, the godfather of psychoanalysis. Uh, and you can look at his book, Interpretation of Dreams, and he will definitively tell you that, you know, hey, if, if you dream about your father, this is what it means. If you dream about your mother, this is what it means. Um, but, you know, that was way back at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, we now know that um, the research that's been done trying to support those interpretations really hasn't panned out. There really isn't any kind of definitive um, significance or reliability for any of those interpretations that Sigmund Freud came up with. So how do you give meaning to your dreams will very much depend on who you are and the set of variables um, that come along with what your life experience has been. So your personal experience, your social and cultural perspectives, and your spiritual beliefs will all play a part in how you give meaning to your dreams. And as a writer, ultimately, that's what's important you're the best judge of what you think your dreams mean. Can we move on to slide five? So I spoke a little bit earlier um, about Joseph Campbell um, and um, I'm just gonna read you um, a bit about uh, from an interview, um, which is uh, um, from Bill Moyer's journal. Um, if you're of a certain age, you may be familiar with um, national public radio presentations. Um, Bill Moyers um, did a presentation through up through the 80s um, that were really um, in-depth interviews with people. And he did one with Joseph Campbell. Um, and this is just a little excerpt um, of what they talked about regarding myths. So Bill Moyers asked Joseph Campbell, so a myth would be an attempt by someone to tell a story about a larger drama than that person is at the moment participating in. And Campbell's answer was, yes, but myths are not invented as stories are. Myths are inspired. They really are. They come from the same realm the dream comes from. People ask me frequently, well, what's the future myth? Well, I could ask, what are you going to dream tonight? So that was back in 1981 and Joseph Campbell already suggesting that dreams are not separate from our experience. They are part of our experience and they influence our experience. And so myths are essentially stories uh, that try to explain how the world works and teach us how to relate to the world and the people or animals around us. And so future myths, well, as a writer, what are you going to dream tonight? What are the future myths that you're going to tell stories about? Because as writers, that's whether we're writing poetry, whether we're writing fiction, whether we're writing creative nonfiction, essentially that's what we do, we tell stories. And the best stories are told from an individual writer's point of view, 
based on our unique experiences that include our dreams. Poets like Michael McClure advocated for developing your own personal mythology that can influence your writing and particularly your poetry, um, which can be used to inform and inspire uh, what happens from that kind of pool of ideas, um, feelings, sensory perceptions that you experience um, that you can use on a regular basis to inform and inspire your writing. He developed the idea of creating a personal universe, um, a deck of cards that can be used as reference material for your writing. And if you received the, the info sheet um, that April sent out, hopefully you've all received that. There's a link in there that you can listen to the lecture he initially gave um, about creating a personal universe deck. Um, he gave that lecture at uh, Naropa University um, and he details pretty clearly, step-by-step, step, how to create your own personal universe deck. And I would really encourage um, all of you to uh, spend a bit of time and, and uh, listen to Michael McClure talking about developing that own personal universe deck. Um, and dreams can most definitely help you connect with and enhance your own personal mythology and may even help you create that, that universe deck for yourself that um, is a pretty awesome way to have reference material, especially if you're getting stuck um, in your writing, you can look to your deck about hmm, where do I take this next piece? Where do I take this story? Where do I take this poem? So slide six, April. So can dreams enrich your writing? Well, we have some evidence that other writers have uh, figured out that, yeah, in fact, they definitely can. Um, and you may not uh, think in terms of some of these books as having been influenced by dreams, but in fact, that's where they started out. So Frankenstein by Mary Shelley came from a dream that she had. The strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde came from a, a dream that Robert Louis Stevenson had. Stuart Little, um, many of you may have um, read that book when you were younger. Um, certainly it's uh, become part of popular culture, um, having been made into movies, etc. cetera. E.B. White came up with that character from a dream that he had. Charlotte Bronte wrote Jane Eyre based on a dream. <laughs> Stephen King wrote The Dreamcatcher and Salem's Lot all based on dreams as well. H.P. Lovecraft, Beyond the Wall of Sleep and Dream Cycle actually came from dreams. Jack Kerouac, The Book of Dreams. And Alias Grace, um, something by Margaret Atwood that's been made into a poem sequence, a play and a novel, started out as a dream. That was the initial, initial inspiration. Jessie Ruddock, who's a Canadian author um, who used her dreams about her child experience, childhood experiences with water um, to inform her main character's action um, in Shot of Blue. And Dennis Theroux um, states in The Postman's Fiance, um, he's also a Canadian author that you might be familiar with. In my view, he says, every novel is written, is a written dream. I'm just going to start over again. In my view, every novel is a written dream. I think that's, that's pretty potent language there, in which the reader is invited to take part. Dreaming is a central topic in all of his novels. The sea and dreams. It's not an accident that these two are always found in what I write. At the symbolic level, they're closely tied. So can we move on to slide seven? So poets 
you may think are, you know, probably maybe the ones who are most affected by using dreams as inspiration in their work. Um, I think you can see that that's pretty widespread uh, across the spectrum of writers, but poets have definitely used um, dreams as part of their, their inspiration in their work. And some of them even more so than just inspiration, actually incorporating it into their work. Um, poets that you might um, be very familiar with and some who you might not be. Um, William Blake in a poem he referred to as a dream. Um, I'll just read you a very, very short excerpt of it. Once a dream did weave a shade o'er my angel guarded bed that an emmet lost its way where on grass methought I lay. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the word emmet, it's a very old word um, meaning ant. So the ant lost its way. We often think about ants losing their way, but that was a dream that Blake had. Um, and he often wrote from his dreams and his dreams were very, very vivid. Um, Allen Ginsberg, one of uh, the greatest, I would say, American poets of the last century, um, often wrote in his journal, and he actually wrote like tons of journals uh, over his lifetime. Um, I would invite you to, um, to look them up and if you can get copies of them. One of the things he did in his journal besides just writing about what was happening in his day was that he also recorded his dreams. And as he was recording his dreams, he wrote poetry uh, incorporating his dreams and incorporated those into his journal, some of which got published later as poems, um, freestanding and others that uh, uh, only stayed in his journal. But this is one um, that, uh, that came out of his dreaming experiences. And this is also a very long poem. A lot of Ginsburg work is very long. Um, I'm only gonna read you a, a very, very small excerpt of it, but this is the beginning of Real as a Dream by Allen Ginsberg. What shall I do with this great opportunity to fly? What is the interpretation of this planet, this moon? If I can dream that I dream and dream anything dreamable, can I dream I am awake? And why do that? When I dream in a dream that I wake up, what happens when I try to move? I dream that I move. And the effort moves and moves till I move and my arm hurts. Then I wake up dismayed. I was dreaming. I was waking when I was dreaming still just now and try to remember next time in dreams that I am dreaming. Edgar Allan Poe also um, was a poet that often wrote um, from his dreams. Uh, and this one is, is, is titled A Dream Within a Dream. And again, this is only a short excerpt from it. I stand amid the roar of a surf tormented shore and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep. And for excerpts of poems, one last one for you. This one by George Gordon Byron. So we're going way back in time. You may know George Gordon Byron as Lord Byron. That's how he's often referred to. This one's called Darkness and also a small excerpt from a very long poem. So obviously this dream was very detailed and important for him. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the internal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation, and all hearts were chilled 
into a selfish prayer for light. A couple other poets you may want to look up um, who also worked very much from their dreams, John Donne, um, Emily Dickinson, and I'm sure if you look around um, on the interweb, um, you'll find way more poets um, and writers who have used dreams in their work. Anyone have any questions at this point? Am I moving along here too quickly? Just want to check in with where everybody's at. Any questions, just put them into the chat if you have them. Yeah, and feel free to just interrupt me there, April, if anybody has any any pressing questions or or doesn't understand sure. um, any of the concepts that are that are coming out in this so far. Uh, just two comments saying that it's great so far and a good pace. Thank you. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like to check in because I can't see all your faces. So I don't know if if I'm talking to folks who are going, what on earth is she babbling about? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so slide eight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about dream states. And you'll remember earlier on, um, I mentioned lucid dreaming. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some other pieces of what dreaming is all about before I get into lucid dreaming, because it's kind of important to have an overall perspective. Of, of what happens when we're dreaming. Uh, there also um, is, are some uh, suggestions for readings um, on the info sheet that you got that are, um, some of them kind of involved in talking about dreaming um, and maybe a bit of a slog to get through, but um, if you're really into uh, learning about dreams and what the scientific sort of perspective is on dreaming, um, definitely worth um, a bit of a read. So a little bit about dream states. So what happens uh, when you go to sleep? Do you immediately you know, put your head on the pillow and start dreaming? Um, no, that's not what happens. Um, we have stages that happen when we go to sleep. Um, hypnagogia um, is the transitional state of consciousness between wakefulness and sleep. Um, and that's kind of where we go initially. Um, when we, we start, you know, nodding off, as we say, um, we start to transition between consciousness um, and being fully awake and going into a deep sleep. Um, dreams have, or I should say the dream state um, is said to have um, three stages, or I should say four stages, but um, the first three are, we don't tend to have a lot of dreams um, in those stages. So stages one through three are um, what are considered non-rapid eye movement sleep. Um, it's also known as quiet sleep. So that can happen on a whole bunch of different levels. Uh, when you're you know, just having a nap or something like that, you probably, if you think about it, um, know the difference between when you're just having that kind of gentle sleep and when you're like really, really out and not aware of much of anything that's going on around you. And that's stage four sleep. And stage four sleep is when we experience um, what's referred to as rapid eye movement sleep. And that's when we tend to dream the most. Um, it's also kind of an odd state of being in because um, it's also known as active sleep because we tend to be dreaming then, but it's also called paradoxical sleep because, and you may have experienced this, you're dreaming and you wanna move, but your body won't let you move. And that's, that's an, um, kind of a real clue that you're in this kind of really deep, deep sleep um, where you're probably having some serious dreams. Um, so you go back to um, Ginsburg's poem where he says, um, and the effort moves and moves. I dream that I move till I move and my arm hurts. So we think we're moving, but we're not moving. And that's paradoxical sleep. And we're in that kind of, of really, really um, what some people refer to um, as sleep paralysis. 
Um, muscle jerks often happen during that, um, that time. Um, and lucid dreams um, are also um, in, in that kind of, of situation um, where we can, we're there, but we're not really um, aware of, of what might be happening, but we've given ourselves some intentions of what might be happening then. So that hypnagogia occurs during the transitional um, period of wakefulness to sleep. And when alpha waves are decreasing, um, but you haven't yet reached that, that first stage of, of sleep. Um, and it's been used by uh, writers and artists like Edward Allan Poe, Franz Kafka, Salvador Dali um, to enhance creative inspirations. Stephen King um, in his book, Writer's Dreaming, uh, said that part of his function um, as a writer is to dream awake. And so um, using that, that first stage of sleep where you're not really, really out of it, you're still sort of semi-aware of, of what's happening, but you are dreaming, but not really, really, you know, so out of it that you can't be aware of what's happening. Um, that's, that's where lucid dreaming can be really, really an important part. So lucid dreaming happens when you're aware that you're dreaming, you're able to recognize your thoughts and emotions as the dream happens. And some people say that by putting intention um, in before you go to sleep, that you can actually guide the dream, that you can control that lucid dream, that you may be able to change the people that are in the dream, you may be able to switch up the environment of the dream, um, that you may even be able to direct the storyline of what's happening in that dream. Um, lucid dreaming, like most dreams, um, usually happens um, later on in the sleep process. Um, sometimes it happens during REM sleep. Sometimes it can feel like it's happening in hypnagogia in that, that liminal space. And that's what I was talking about when we first started um, the presentation is that as an artist, um, I often find that I'm directing what's happening in that liminal state, in that hypnagogic place, um, that liminal space before I'm actually in deep, deep REM sleep. Um, and, and we'll carry that into, into deeper sleep, um, but um, remembering it um, can be directed more that when, when you're in that, that, that deep REM sleep, you can also take it with you and direct it into, the, into that REM sleep. Um, you can extend REM sleep by getting enough sleep overall. Because if you're not getting that deep sleep, you're not going to get REM sleep. And that's one of the reasons that we know that when we talked about the reason that sleep is important to our overall health, one of the things that we do know is that if people are deprived of that deep sleep, of that REM sleep, that rapid eye movement sleep, that stage four sleep, um, that your body um, can't properly cycle um, through all of the things that it needs to do. And we don't we don't really know why that happens, but what we do know is that people who are deprived of that sleep um, often start experiencing um, psychological problems, um, often start to hallucinate over time. Um, it's one of the reasons why torture, unfortunately, has been used um, over um, the centuries um, to keep people from going into deep sleep because people um, really start to deteriorate quickly. Um, if they are deprived of that deep sleep for long enough. So any questions um, anyone has about any I of did that? see one question and also a potential answer, but I'll ask you the question too. Sure. Um, when does sleepwalking occur and do you dream at this time? I'm not sure if you were, know the answer to that. Um, Elise said that um, she thinks it occurs in N3 sleep, non-REM sleep is when sleepwalking occurs. I mean, you're not usually dreaming. Do you know about that? Um, I'd have, you know, I, I can't say definitively, and I have a feeling that that may really differ um, depending on individuals. What, what I can tell you is that there is sleepwalking that's organically in, induced, um, and there is sleepwalking that can be induced by medications. Um, and so um, some of the medications that are out there um, that people take to help them sleep 
can actually um, induce a, a kind of um, memory loss situation where they're actually up and moving around um, and think they're dreaming, but they're not actually dreaming. They're, they're actually moving around and they may think they're sleepwalking. They may look like they're sleepwalking, but they're actually in a, in a medicated kind of trance. Um, and uh, I, I won't uh, go into the names of some of those medications, but um, that, that's one of, the, um, one of the side effects of some of the, the sleep medications that are out there these days um, is that they can induce states that look a lot like sleepwalking. So um, as far as when dreams occur or don't occur during sleepwalking, I'd have to look that up. Um, and I encourage you to, uh, to do that research yourself as well. Interesting question though, thank you for asking that. So if we can move to the next slide. So we talked about making sure that um, if we're gonna use dreams as inspiration or content for our writing, how do we remember them? Well, we need to have some sort of a system, either some way uh, to record that. So um, there are lots of systems that are out there. Um, some people write things down, they keep a journal, such as I was saying that Allen Ginsberg kept. Um, some people, and Allen Ginsberg did part of this as well too, um, these sketch things out. So if, if writing stuff down first thing in the morning is just you know too much of a hassle, um, maybe you just sketch things out or maybe you just write a few words down um, or maybe um, you just draw a, a quick conceptualization of one piece of your dream or something that will trigger your memory um, maybe later on. Um, it's probably the best thing to do and the, and the accepted sort of, of wisdom around recording your dreams is that you don't wait till four o'clock in the afternoon after you know, you've been up and about all day um, to start recording your dreams. Um, it tends to work best when you make a practice of recording them um, shortly after waking up. I mean, if you're like me and you just aren't functional, um, until after you've had your coffee in the morning, let, let yourself have a cup of coffee or, or be, you know, recording those things um, while you're drinking your coffee, but do it as close to waking up as you can and do it in the present tense. So don't record it in terms of um, this happened um, as though it's already over with, record it as though it's already, that it's in process, record it as though your dream is still ongoing. So that's what I mean by in the present tense. So rather than saying, you know, last night I dreamed about, you know, Susie who, um, you know, had her dog out for a walk, record it in terms of, I'm dreaming that Susie is out walking the dog. That's the present tense, right? So be there, be in the dream again and record it as much as you possibly can seeing it again in your wakeful state and writing it down. Also, if we're having a dream that maybe wasn't particularly comfortable for us, uh, we may go like, I don't wanna remember that. I don't wanna talk about that. That was you know, something that I can't be right. I can't have dreamed that. That's our self-censor coming in. And if we're gonna get serious about being in contact with our dreams, we need to do it without judgment. We need to recognize that whatever we're dreaming is perfectly okay to dream. We're not necessarily acting on our dreams. We're simply recording. Them. So making that distinction between dreaming something is not doing something. We were just having a dream and it's okay to dream about whatever it is that we were dreaming about. And even though we may be writing about it, doesn't mean we're taking any action about it. So if it's something that was frightening or something that was disturbing to you, you can still write about it. It doesn't mean that anything is gonna transpire out of it. it. Doesn't mean you even have to use it in your writing, but you may wanna just get in the habit of not self-censoring about what comes out of your dreams. Um, and also if you feel the need to interpret your dreams as we talked about a bit earlier, um, and you get into that headspace about, you know, 
is this right or is this wrong? You know, did this dream about a house mean that I want to talk about my mother um, or that, you know, I had an argument with my dad when I was six years old and now I'm revisiting that. Um, don't do it while you're recording your dreams. Just don't worry about it. Whatever you want to interpret your dream about later, you feel free to do that. That's up to you. But don't do it while you're recording your dreams. Just be there in your dream. Do it in the present tense and just let it flow however it's going to. You may not remember all the pieces of what you were dreaming about, and that's perfectly okay because you can always say, you know, as you're recording it in the present tense, don't know what happened next. There's, you know, I'm not sure. You know, just skip over it. Just move on to what you remember. Um, and it may be even more interesting by doing that because the gaps may lend themselves to becoming material for your writing as well as the actual content of what you're writing down. So it's just some ideas about how to record your dreams again without judgment and doing it as soon as possible and in the present tense. So, can we move to slide 10? So when you are recording those, those snippets, some things to look for. So besides recording in the present tense, you want to get as much information out of those dreams. You want to mind them. Um, we said dream delving and digging for content, prospecting in your dreams. So essentially you're mining your dreams for content. You're finding you know, all of the, the little details that, that make our writing so interesting, that make our poetry so interesting. And so when you're reporting your dreams, try not to just say, you know, I saw Sally out walking her dog. Also think about what did Sally look like? Where was she walking? What did her dog look like? What were things smelling like? Was it raining? Was the ground, you know, coming up to you from that scent, you know, before it rains? You knew that it was about to pour? Um, or was it the wind blowing hard? What were all of those details that were happening? Um, and do that as though the dream is still happening. So, but making sure that, that you're really paying attention to all of those things that are going on around you in the dream. What did you see, smell, taste, hear, or touch? We often don't take that into consideration, all of those sensory perceptions that in our dream that we're having that enrich our writing so much rather than abstractedly saying things um, like, uh, you know, I was in a park. Where was that park? Was it, was it autumn? Was it, you know, was it winter? Where uh, was I walking? Was I running? Um, where was my body in that park? Was I lying down as in William Blake's dream? Was, was I standing? Um, was I jumping up to, to catch a leaf that was blowing in the wind? All of those kinds of little details, um, where our body was, um, were there colors that repeated in the dream that you noticed? Was the landscape human scale? Was it larger? Was it smaller? Was it a landscape that you were familiar with? Was it perfectly strange to you? Um, was it something that um, really seemed that it was, you know, from another dimension, um, perhaps that that you know was disconcerting to you because there was nothing that you could connect with, or was it, you know, so familiar that you were, you know, felt that you were back in a place that you'd always known. Hard to say, but don't ignore those, those kinds of details. Who were the actors in your dream? Was it you or were you acting as someone else? Were there humans in the dream? Were there animals in the dream? Were there what we call aliens in the dream? Creatures that we, we couldn't even identify? Were there mythological components to the dream? Um, was the dream calm or was it frightening? So what were your emotions like in the dream? Did you want to linger there or were you trying hard to wake up? 
you may also want to know um, what kind of conversations might have been happening in the dream. Were you talking to someone? Was somebody talking to you? Um, were you writing things down in the dream, perhaps even? Um, was somebody handing you pieces of information? Um, were there elements of your dream that appear in other dreams that you've recorded? So when you go back and you look at your dream journal, are there connections that you can make between the various times that you've recorded your dreams? And is there any kind of a theme or a thread that you see happening between those various dreams that might you know, perhaps be um, meet for your writing in some way to say that, hey, you know, this is something that obviously is very important to me because I keep dreaming about it. Maybe I wanna write about it. Maybe I need to say something about this recurring kind of message that comes to me in my dreams. So when you're writing these things down, um, as I said earlier, um, you may wanna write them down verbatim. You may wanna write down a summary of them, but make it as full of content as you possibly can. Um, use the present tense. This will help keep the dream fresh as you record. Um, you might want to make sure that you're also not spending an hour or two doing this. Write as quickly as you can. Um, and if you need to, to use uh, sort of a guide to do that. Um, automatic writing um, is a good technique to use. So automatic writing means that you're not really thinking about what you're writing. It's you put the pencil or the pen in your hand and you try not to even look at the page very much. Um, you just let whatever is coming out, come out, you write it down. You don't look at it. You don't go back and read it as you're writing because as writers, you know, it's one of the things that we often do um, too much is try to edit our work as we're putting it out there. We don't want to do that. When we're recording our dreams, we just want to let it just flow. Um, we don't want to be editing because when we start editing, we're going to self-censor. Just be aware of that. And, and so if you can stop yourself from editing while you're writing and use automatic writing as a technique, if you're a person who is, you know, prone to self-censoring or self-editing, um, and I think all of us are at various and sundry times, um, make sure that you're just simply recording, that you're not analyzing your work, you're not editing your work, you're not correcting your work. It doesn't matter if you're misspelling words. It doesn't matter if you don't um, really even understand the words that are coming out, because maybe that's something that came out in your dream. And you know who knows what that might eventually be useful for. Okay, so next slide. And April, you beat me to it. <laughs> so, so choosing your tools. So I had suggested um, that, you know, probably um, the ultimate timeless no fail app um, for recording your dreams is a notebook and a pencil or pen. Um, you can even find notebooks these days that are designed to help you record and keep track of your dreams over time. I think whatever notebook um, feels good to you, um, even if it's just a pad of paper and you have uh, just you know, single sheets for recording your dreams, you can always you know, hole punch those and put them into a, a kind of three ring binder or something like that later on. It really doesn't matter. Um, you know, if you're like Emily Dickinson, um, she wrote much of her poetry on just odd scraps of paper and old envelopes and whatever happened to be around, but she wrote um, when it moved her to write. And so she didn't worry about whether or not she had the proper things to be recording what she was writing. She was really concentrating on the fact that it was important for her to be writing. So, but if you're, you know, more into, um, into, doing things uh, in a more technologically current manner. Um, there actually are apps out there that you can download um, that can help you um, figure out how to record your dreams. Um, and they, they really vary. Um, I, if, you're, if you're into doing things that way, um, I suggest you look at, um, a different, at a bunch of different ones. Um, 
they're very much guided in asking you how uh, how to look at the different pieces of, of what you're recording, um, telling you to you know to do it in present tense and so on and so forth. And so it's kind of like a um, a guided journey um, into uh, recording your dreams. Um, some of them um, that you might want to investigate are called dream catcher. Um, there's another one called dream journal, daydream. Um, another one called dream keeper. Um, some of them you have to pay for. Some of them are free. Um, but if that's your thing and you like technology, then you know that's that's fine for doing that. Um, if you like uh, doing things more old school um, and you're not into writing first thing in the morning, uh, using a voice recorder, you know, and might be the easiest way to do that. Just speaking into your recorder, um, and there are also um, voice recorders out there now that and programs that, um, if you're wanting to then put your, um, your voice recording into text. You don't have to you know, spend hours uh, transcribing that yourself. You can do that almost directly now with some of the technology that's out there uh, that can transcribe your voice um, into text. Uh, so um, that, yeah, that's, that might be a way that, that works for you. Um, if writing and, and talking into a, um, a recorder doesn't work for you, um, try writing your dreams down um, as quick sketches, just parts of your dream, trying to incorporate um, the details uh, that we talked about a bit earlier about the details of your dream that are most vivid when you wake up. So uh, when I mentioned before about, you know, you're in a park, um, maybe you do a quick sketch about what part of the park you were looking at. Was there a tree there? Were there flowers there? Were you, you know, looking at the grass? Were you looking at the clouds in the sky? Um, was it raining? Was it windy? Was there snow? Uh, were there leaves on the ground? Um, was there an ant? As in Blake's poem, were there ants crawling about on the grass for you? Um, and just looking at, at uh, those pieces that become most vivid to you as you're waking up and making sure that you record them. So that's kind of an overview of uh, looking at your dreams and ways that some writers have used uh, in dreaming to help enhance their writing. I hope that's been helpful for you. And if anyone has uh, any questions at this point um, or would like to comment on things or share any of their own experiences around how they've used dreams in their work, I'm just going to see some of the messages that. So I'm just looking. Neil has said some sources say the, the best way to move as little as possible in bed after waking up with the dream. Um, just reach for pen and paper and recording device, and the feelings involved can fade away very quickly. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, and Marianne says that um, she likes writing her dreams in her daily journal. And then I know um, what from my waking life influenced my dreams and vice versa. Ah, so making those comparisons between wakefulness and dream states. And you find that sounds, sounds like you find that that's a useful thing to do for you in your own writing is, is having that, that juxtaposition uh, between wakefulness um, and dreaming. And just scrolling through here. And Diane says that recurring dreams um, affect her writing and that she doesn't really rec need to record them um, because uh, they come to her so regularly that, um, that she remembers them vividly. Hmm. And I'm, I'm curious if you want to put in the chat, Diane, what, what have you done with that information? How have you used that in your writing? Or have you? And Debbie says she understands it with lucid dreaming, you can actually influence them. Yeah, that, that's 
what we were talking about um, in the presentation a bit. We didn't go into it in much depth, but there's a lot of, of, uh, of information out there about lucid dreaming if you're interested in, in looking into it further. Basically, uh, what the majority of uh, kind of, of uh, advice that goes into how to dream lucidly, so to speak, is uh, to place an intention as to what it is that you want to look at in the dream um, as you're falling asleep and to really focus on that intention. And a lot of folks say that um, that's how you can then guide or direct the dream into problem solving for you um, or into where you even travel to in your dreaming uh, or who you might be speaking to in your dreaming and so on and so forth. Um, and that, that intention is, is really sort of um, the, the most important part about it. Um, Diane says she dreams about houses and rooms opening up um, almost every week, old houses that she's lived in. And so um, she writes a lot about houses and rooms. Aha, so you are using that information um, from your dreaming. And... I'm just looking at what Barb says. An almost 3D live map is a recurring dream that she just can't put into words. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm just scrolling through the chat here. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, a lot of folks are using some of these techniques already. And I'm just wondering now that, uh, now that you have a bit more information, um, if you haven't used this technique before, um, how many of you think that you're gonna try using some of these things? How many folks assume that that you know when you wake up tomorrow? Aha! So Sylvia says. Um, Sylvia says she's going to keep recording her dreams. Um, Elise says that she likes the idea of having a dream sketchbook, uh, and uh, I hope that that you're going to try doing that, Elise, uh, and see how that works for you. Um, Emma says that she's going to try recording her dreams more often. Um, Barb says that she's uh, definitely going to bring um, her sketch pad to bed. Uh, that could be an interesting kind of approach. So first thing in the morning, you wake up and you've got all your materials right there. And Marie says um, that she likes to use a dream journal um, to help with her writing. Ilona says that she's going to put a notebook and a pencil on her night table tonight and see where that goes. I hope it takes you to some interesting places, Alona. And Jeremy says he's gonna try this, um, that uh, he's gonna free up some more time for creative interests that he's neglected. Well, I'm glad that, uh, that you're gonna commit to doing that, Jeremy. It sounds like that's gonna be an interesting process for you. And Marianne says she's going to look back at her journal and see what her dreams have told her. Um, so she's going to um, re-explore things. And thank you for mentioning that, Marianne, because I think that's a, a really important um, piece. Um, and the whole concept of doing a journal is that, um, like the, the personal universe deck, um, it's magic for us to have uh, reference materials that don't go away. So, you know, we may have um, a dream, record it, and then, you know, think like, you know, oh, well, I don't really have any use for this. But, you know, maybe two years or three years or five years, we're looking back for reference material, and that jumps out at us 
it's there for us. We had that dream, we recorded that dream. It's always there for us to use in whatever capacity that we might want to use it later on down the road. 